so let's get started. As I mentioned, this is our sixth episode of Forest Fridays, a conversation about conservation in Kauai's forests. Uh, this event is brought to you by Kauai Invasive Species Committee and Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project. My name is Kim Rogers. I work with Kauai. And in previous talks and conversations, we've discussed the importance of our forests to our watersheds here on Kauai. We've talked about the unfortunate declining forest bird populations. We've talked about the forest as a sacred place. We've also talked about the many different ways that we connect with the forest. If you missed any of these, they were recorded, so they are available, and you can go to either KISC's or the Forest Birds YouTube page and watch the previous five. All those recordings are there. Today's topic of conversation, though, is what is the fate of our forests? And as an extension of that, um, what exactly is a forest? And is a forest an ecosystem? And are any of our forest ecosystems on Kauai perhaps endangered? So those are just a few of the discussions and questions we're going to address. There's lots and lots to address. Um, and joining me today on our panel are Shauna Walsh, Mehana Vaughn, Michelle Clark, and Lucas Benke. And uh, I'm going to be giving detailed uh, introductions of each of them, but for in for now, if you would maybe spotlight all of those for us, Julia. Yep. So everybody can yes. see who we're talking about. There's Lucas. And Julia, by the way, is working behind the scenes this time. We trade off positions. She is with the Kauai Forest Board Recovery Project. Hi, so everybody. there's our panel. Thank you all for being here. Uh, give us a wave to everybody out there. Yay. <laughs> A couple housekeeping things and then we'll get into introductions. Um, this is a Zoom event. We are also broadcasting live to Facebook. If you would like to share this on your Facebook page or uh, your personal page, you can easily do that. Just go to either the Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project Facebook page or the KISC Facebook page and just click the share button and share just like you would share anything else. Um, we are also recording this and it will be on YouTube at a later date. Um, if you are joining us on Facebook, feel free to drop in questions on either the KISS or Forest Bird Facebook pages, and uh, we will monitor those and ask, uh, share them with our panels, panelists. Also on Zoom, there's that chat function. So those of us joining on Zoom, if you would, uh, feel free to turn your video on. We love to see faces and the people that are out there. But uh, please mute yourself if you would, so we don't get a lot of uh, you know, background noise that's a little bit distracting. But use the chat function um, and let us know right now, if you would, pop into the chat function just to make sure we all know how to use it. Let us know where you're joining us from. So you know, if it's on island here, Kauai, if it's another island, maybe your Ahupua'a, your town, your Moku, if you're outside Hawaii, where are you joining us from? We love to see the many different people who are visiting us. We, oh, look, we've got California, we have Hilo, Wisconsin, Oahu, Kalaheo, um, Los Angeles. Oh, this is fantastic. We love to see the many, many different people that we're reaching. This is great. Thank you all for being here. And now that you know what that chat function does, um, at any point in time, feel free to drop in questions. We will be monitoring those. Um, and let's see, the next thing we would like for you to do is, uh, and for those of you who have participated with us before, you know what we're gonna do. It's the Mentee Project. So if you go to open a new browser in your computer, go to mentee.com. And if you wanna start sharing your screen again, Julia, feel free. Mentee.com, and we have a question for you to participate. And that is, we'd like to know from your point of view, from the many things that you may do and enjoy doing in the forest, what changes have you seen over time in our forests? Whether that be lowland forests, whether that be forests um, on the North Shore, whether that be Koke'e, if you would um, go to menti.com and then you type in that code, which is 2109, 3484, and you'll be able to answer. 
So what changes have you seen in the forest? I see that there's more weeds. I see more people in the forest, new non-native species, more work that's happening in the forest. Oh great, people are now figuring this out and we're getting more answers. Fewer birds, there is that. Um, invasive species are higher. They're moving up in elevation. Great. Not enough infrastructure. More replanted forests. Let's see, recovery. We've got some invasives, fewer birds. Yeah, great. Thank you all for participating. So feel free to keep answering that if you haven't already. Um, but I think uh, we will come back to that later in our show. For now, we can stop sharing that screen right now. We're going to jump in. We're going to chat with our panelists. Um, I could spend a whole lot of time reading long biographies of each of our panelists, but um, I kind of think it's better for them to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about who they are, what I'm always particular interested in, and we try to do on these Forest Fridays, is hear from our panelists, not only what they do, but how they ended up doing what they do, like how they got there, because it's my hope that there's some young people listening, joining us today, and we hope that they hear about the cool efforts that's being done in conservation and they can see a path to a career for them here on Kauai. So let's see, let's start with Shauna, if you don't mind, Shauna Walsh with NTBG. Aloha everyone, thank you for joining. Yeah, so as Kim said, I work at the National Tropical Botanical Garden. I'm a conservation biologist there. And so in summary, my role, it's in implementing the Hawaii strategy for plant conservation. And what that means in reality is focusing on rare plant species to make collections, conduct applied research to help inform management, conservation decisions. Oh, in summary, my role and, is in implementing the Hawaii strategy. Oh, I hear myself <laughs> going back. Um, anyway, um, and do outreach and education as well. And a bit about my background and how I got there. I, well, it's kind of funny that just my interest in plants maybe starts out, you know, from <laughs> conception. My mom met my dad because she went into his little plant nursery he had here in Kalaheo, where I am now on Kauai. Um, they met that way. And uh, so me and my siblings were born on Kauai. And they were lucky, I guess we were all lucky. They happened to move to Maui just before a Niki hit. So I grew up in Kihei on Maui. Um, it wasn't really until high school that I started to learn about native species in the island, sadly, that it wasn't sooner than that. But I joined this volunteer program, like environmental um, volunteer program for high schoolers. And we did a lot of different work around the island, but the most impactful, and I'm so fortunate to have had this opportunity, but we went, there was a group of like four or five of us, and we went to Koho'olawe for three days with the Koho'olawe Island Reserve Commission, and we were doing restoration work there, and I, it's funny, I don't, I've shared that a bit, but just um, in other instances where people have shared like something that's been impactful in their life I often hear of their people's experience on Koho'olawe being kind of a, a turning point in their path and where they ended up so th yeah that was a big turning point and I started going to Maui Community College and then transferred to UH Manoa and it wasn't until I got there that I learned about like there was a program, a department to study plants and it was called botany. And I was like, oh, this is for me. I didn't know it existed. So I uh, transferred to that program and I started coming to Kauai about 10 years ago, actually, working with NTBG um, and uh, Brighamia and Cygnus. And I ended up doing my master's work on that species. And then when before I was finishing up, I saw a job opportunity. Um, a job posting with NTBG on Kauai and I was like that was that's a dream dream job dream place to live and but I looked at the um, like the qualifications I was like oh I don't meet all the qualifications like I wasn't going to apply and actually it was Kavika Winter he was the director of Limuhuli Garden at the time and he was like you're I, I forget the analogy I wish I remember but he's like 
you're just seeing like you have to look at the trees and not just or something anyway he encouraged me to apply and i did and here i am six years later and yeah in my dream job um and in a very special place so thank you so much for having me on this panel Absolutely. I love that you're here. I love that story because it, it is, right? You're like homegrown and, you know, raised in conservation and plants, and now you're working with them. That's a great story. Thank you, Shauna. Yeah. And Mehana, um, let's hear a little from you, if you wouldn't mind. I know you're also a local girl. You grew up here on Kauai. Um, but, you know, tell us a little bit more about that and what your path was to what you're currently doing today, if you would. Ana I make aloha ya oko pakaya po mayuko o kavaikini ai ke kai o kapaani ilalo kaipuha aloha mai ho oli loa vai ike ya oko pakaya po aloha um, yes, I too am Kauai grown. <laughs> it's nice to see Siana here and um, just nice to be with you all today. Um, I am a professor with JB Friday um, in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Management at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm also in the Sea Grant College program, and I do work with Hawaiian studies um, through a hire called Hui Aina Momona, um, where we work on abundant lands and thriving people throughout Hawaii, um, and especially work with community groups that are taking care of lands and waters in Hawaii to support their efforts, um, and really try to be a bridge between rural Hawaii communities and the university, um, which is wonderful. It means our children, our students get to learn in the field, uh, community members get to come and teach our students, um, experts like all of you are the best teachers um, and we're grooming students to go out into the fields that many of you are in um, so it's super rewarding work I, I really truly do have my dream job um, I'm also a mother of three children um, who love the forest and love koke and I'm excited to be here today talking about forest I'll just share two experiences that I think brought me um, to this work uh, first is growing up with my grandmother um, Amelia Anna Kaopua Bailey, my mother's mother. Um, she's from Kalihi, Oahu, grew up very urban, um, but got really captivated by Hawaiian lei. Um, when my mother and father got married and wanted to have a Hawaiian wedding in 1968, after they both graduated from college, um, they were high school and college sweethearts. And my mom wanted to wear a haku lei, a head lei, a haku headle, and they had to figure out where to get one in Honolulu at that time. And there were two main laymakers, Auntie Bobby Meheula, um, Auntie Marie McDonald, and her family, her sister, Auntie Ermalee Pomroy. And so my grandmother sought them out. They ordered lei from the Big Island. They came, they were made with wire and baby's breath and mock orange. Um, and my grandmother was captivated. She took them apart after the wedding. She put them back together. Um, she was hooked. And so at an age when her children had gone to college, um, her oldest was getting married. She took on a whole new life. Um, as she says, a Renaissance laymaker. No one taught her. Um, she went to Bishop Museum. She started looking in every picture she could of how Hawaiians adorned her, ourselves. She said, we made lay of everything, of seaweed, of greenery. Um, and she became a master of vili lei making. So I'm sitting here today making a vili lei. If I disappear for a moment, I have to pick a few more things from the yard and add. Um, but vili is when you wrap. And so my some of my earliest memories of koke are my tutu coming from Oahu and wanting to go malka, always wanting to go malka and driving in the car, getting kind of seasick and car sick. And I mean, tutu not caring. I could throw up in her lap. She didn't care because we were going to the mountains. We were going to see the ohia. She was overjoyed. She was in her element. Um, and those experiences of traveling to koke as a child, field trips, um, Camp Slogget as a child, elementary school, going in middle school to Alaka'i Swamp long before the boardwalk, being in mud up to here, falling in Blackberry. I still have scars across my face from the Blackberry, um, but lots of time in Koke'e as a young person on Kauai and then returning here after college um, to serve in my own community at work at Waipa Foundation in Hanalei. Um, I come to my work at the university as a middle school teacher and an Aina-based educator. And we worked with um, seven students from Kapa High School um, for a year at Waipa. And the culmination of their time with us was the opportunity to take them into the back of Lumaha'i Valley with the Nature Conservancy at Kamehameha Schools. At the very, very beginning of that 
project. It was a sort of a reconnaissance trip to go and look for the first time at that valley. Um, none of the students had been there, of course, but their families knew the place and they had stories of the place. Um, it was my first and last time on a helicopter. I've only been on a helicopter from Waipa Valley over the ridge to Lumaha'i, um, really all of 20 minutes to a whole nother world. Um, we helicoptered to the very back um, below Namalakama, um, where you're in bog. Um, and it was my first time seeing bog outside of Alaka'i. It was so beautiful and thriving and amazingly native. Every one of the Miley sisters around your feet, you didn't even want to step anywhere. Everywhere we stepped, we felt we were making a new puddle, a new imprint, tracking a seed. Um, it really, you really felt the Valakua element. Um, and the students, but there were some invasive species, Pydemia, an Australian tree firm. So we were going for those and watching these high school students spread out through the forest. We hiked down into the, low, the dry lowland forest and to see dry forest in Hawaii was amazing too, or to see, to see lower land forest that had alani, a huge, amazing mokihana, white, orange, and yellow ohia all in one place. I'd never seen anything like it, um, but yet the impacts that were just coming in. And so to hear those students spread through the forest counting 149 Clydemia, 642nd tree fern, and just going for it for days, so proud of themselves, working so hard. And many of those students have gone into conservation. And that experience propelled me from education to education about Aina and education about conservation and the intersection of conservation, community, and culture in Hawaii. That's beautiful, Mehana. I love those stories. I thank you for taking those kids in there and you know getting those invasives out. You have tremendous stories and experiences and memories. Um, I love hearing. I, I'm always I always hear new ones from you that I've never heard before. Whenever we chat, and one thing you didn't talk about that I'm just going to put a little um, share with everybody is Mehana and I have known each other for oh gosh I don't know how many years, um, fifteen or more maybe close to 20, uh, but we have a writing connection. Mehana is a gifted writer as well. So um, she has a book too that um, is definitely well worth your time to read. So I, I highly recommend that. Um, thank you again. I would not be without you, Kim, who are such oh. a gifted writer and other oh. gifted poet writers, mentoring each other along, pushing each other. <laughs> Absolutely. It takes a community, doesn't it, uh, to write anything. So yeah, love that. Michelle, let's jump over to you now and hear um, a little bit about your story, if you will. Again, just as a refresher, kind of maybe where you grew up, how you got to Kauai, and how you got into the position doing what you're doing today. Sure. Aloha, everyone. It's a long and winding path that I <laughs> ventured onto, but um, currently I am a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I work here on Kauai and Oahu to uh, do habitat restoration and recover threatened and endangered species. And I work with private landowners and the state of Hawaii and nonprofit organizations to do this. So a lot of my work is project based. And yes, it is my dream job. And I never thought that I would be doing this, um, especially since I dropped out of uh, college to here. <laughs> it didn't really have a, a great plan. But um, after about three years of waiting tables, and, and curiously enough, uh, meeting a um, somebody that worked at Kilauea Point National Wildlife Refuge he used to come in every day in his uniform. And so, you know, I'd be like, oh, what do, what do you do? Why are you wearing a uniform? And so we, we strike up conversation and he recruited me to start volunteering at Kilauea Point. And that was about 25 years ago or so. And so I was doing that. I was interested in wildlife and, you know, trying to work in the outdoors. And, um, but Somehow I like got this National Geographic in the mail and it had this, and it was about an article about endangered species. And I was like, wow, like, I think that's what I want to do. I want to like work to save endangered species, but you know, I'm probably going to have to go to the Amazon or something to do that. I didn't even realize that I was living in the endangered species capital of the world, which is odd, but you know, so I, I decided to go back to school. I went to um, UH Hilo on the Big Island, and that was just such a wonderful experience. And within like the first two weeks, I 
realize that I was living in the endangered species capital of the world and I don't need to move to the Amazon to save endangered species. And so I ended up getting an internship with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service and, it, and I was a soil conservationist. So it wasn't exactly like what I was envisioning like on my quest to save endangered species because um, NRCS also focuses on soil con soil erosion and air quality and water quality. So it's more of a, a, a holistic holistic environmental job rather than just you know doing conservation. So but it was it was perfect for me because it, it introduced me to Kauai and it taught me how to work with um, private landowners, farmers and ranchers and people of different different ethnicities and um, a wide variety of projects. And so I did that for about eight, eight or nine years. And then the position that I have now was advertised and I was like, I've got to get that job. That's my dream job. And I got it, so <laughs> that's that's how I got to where I am. And I've been working in this position for uh, since 2008. So uh, that's great. That's a great story too. I love. How, <laughs> I love you know like it's all happening in Hawaii, right? Education, everything, the opportunities are all happening here. We don't necessarily have to leave, right, to get these. Uh, that, to get the education and to get these experiences. And who was it at U.S. Fish and Wildlife? If you don't mind, if you can share, who was it oh, that recruited you at Kilauea Jim, Point? Jim Glenn, he used to be the um, refuge manager out there. Right, right. I volunteer out there myself. Ago. So I, I have a history and know a few of those people. So great. See, from volunteer to now working for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Let's move now to um, Lucas. If you will, Lucas is with the Nature Conservancy. Give us your story. Hello, everyone. My name is Lucas Banke. I am the director of the Kauai Terrestrial Program for the Nature Conservancy's Hawaii and Palmyra chapter. Uh, I actually just started this job. I was the natural resource manager for the last eight years, managing the field team, doing uh, invasive species work primarily, but watershed protection. Uh, the Nature Conservancy's Kauai Terrestrial Program is the coordinator of the Kauai Watershed Alliance, which is a partnership of private and public landowners, uh, including the state of Hawaii, several major private landowners that have a stake in the priority watershed of the island of Kauai, which when we define priority watershed or we are really talking about healthy native forest where there are high degrees of rainfall. So native forest and rain is a pretty easy thing to sort of point out on the map. And we've been working to protect uh, Kauai's watershed since 2001, essentially. So we're actually at the 20 year anniversary of TNC's effort to protect native forests on Kauai. Uh, again, I've only been with the Nature Conservancy for a little over eight years. Uh, I actually came to it somewhat organically as well. I started with on my work on Kauai with the Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project. Thank you for having us here today. Uh, and I, I came for a seasonal position in 2007 because I had read about the Puaiohi and the endangered birds of the Alakai Swamp. Uh, years before when I was in college in California and following a short stint on the Big Island uh, working on a USGS project on avian disease uh, across elevations on the volcanoes of Kilauea and Mauna Loa. I had a little bit of knowledge in my in my back pocket. I did a bunch of bird jobs and then I got one seasonal job here and I, I basically never left. <laughs> Uh, I worked my way up from uh, seasonal field technician to seasonal crew leader to field supervisor. And then I actually had the opportunity working with uh, Pauline Roberts, my previous supervisor, and then Callie, uh, Lisa Crampton, um, to go back to university and get a master's degree in uh, fish, wildlife, and conservation biology at Colorado State University. So uh, I actually got to spend half my year in Colorado, well, at least one semester of my year in Colorado and the rest of my year uh, 
chasing forest birds uh, on the Alakai Plateau on, in Kauai. Um, I grew up in Northern California on a river, the Russian River, sort of northern stretch of it. It's an agricultural river stream. I grew up skipping rocks, jumping from, from log to log and, and chasing my dog, you know, all along this sort of rural riparian habitat. And then, you know, when that opportunity to apply for a job working with Puaiohi, which are essentially restricted to the streams of the upper plateau of the Alakai, uh, I knew that that job was for me and there was, I, there had to be a way for me to get it, much like Michelle. <laughs> uh, and, and so, you know, in my email, uh, my cover letter, this is about kids, right? I'm trying to get, tell people how, how we get to this place. I made it personal. I had worked with Oma'o on the big island uh, and I knew that, you know, one of their primary foods was Olapa or Ankwai, also Lapa Lapa. And I, I put in a line about really hoping that I would get the chance to get my hands stained purple again, because that's what happens when you are banding uh, thrushes in Hawaii and, you know, they, they poop on you. <laughs> and so your hands end up purple at the end of the day. And when, even though I was probably not the most qualified and maybe I wasn't really high up on the list, maybe my uh, resume didn't jump out, that line caught the attention of the director at the time or the coordinator at the time. And that's what, that's what pulled my name out of the hat. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's kind of about making a poop joke. Uh, and that is literally like how my career sort of started on Kauai. And I've been here almost 15 years now. And that is something that, you know, I don't know, I've just, I've been really, I think, fortunate, a lot of privilege that I have to acknowledge in my life. But I've also been trying to find ways now, especially, you know, as natural resource manager and, you know, as sort of this entity that works across landowner boundaries and doesn't necessarily own land, the Nature Conservancy doesn't own any land on the island of Kauai. How do we facilitate new ways of looking at resource management? We've been following a pretty traditional path for uh, conservation. You know, our, our tried and true method for protecting a forest and seeing the understory rebound has been to build strategic fences, conduct weed control, conduct uh, or remove animals, including pigs, goats, and deer from that forest and protect it. And we know that that helps the forest to respond. But sort of, we, we've, we've gone to most of the low hanging fruit, I would say, on the Alakai Plateau, the most remote places that have very little human habitation or have, have really rarely been used in the past. And now we're kind of thinking about how do we protect more spaces and how do we draw in communities and stakeholders that are different than the ones that we've traditionally worked with to get that done. So you know, I'm really excited to, to be on this panel with Mehana and Shauna and Michelle because I know that they're all they're all doing that in, in very special ways. So that's yeah. that's my shtick. Thank you, Lucas. It's a great panel, a great group of people doing some great work. Um, and I've learned new tidbits of information about each and every one of you. Thank you for sharing that backstory. Um, I want to point out, Julia has been hard at work dropping links into the chat box. So there's oodles of information that she's included about each one of our panelists and more. So don't forget to pull up that chat box and um, and check out some of those links. But now let's 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 talk forests, okay? Um, in particular, the first thing I want to address and get out of the way is oftentimes, and I catch myself doing this too, we talk about the forest, singular, as if there's only one forest on this island. Um, oftentimes I hear from people, and I think this too, that it's like just kokee, right? Is the forest. Um, but I'd love, and I'm gonna turn to you, Shauna. Um, to talk about, you know, the forest as first an ecosystem and secondly about maybe the different and myriad kinds of forests that we have on this island. Could you speak to that for us? Sure. Yeah, I see Julia put in a definition here in the chat for forest. So there's different definitions of forest. Um, a lot of them are based on stature um, or based on percent cover of woody tree species. But in any case, we have a lot of different forest types on the island, and that's in part due to the diversity of climactic conditions across the island. 
um, we're all so the trade winds we're orographic rainfall so um, like the windward sides we see are wetter versus the leeward sides that are drier um, the topography is so complex on this island so with you know the climate the topography all of that we have these really dissected different forest types all across the island. Um, so if I was to kind of break it down a little bit, I'm not going to list all the different forest types because <laughs> there's a lot. But for example, we have lowland, uh, co we have coastal, lowland, montane, and that's all based on thresholds of elevation, um, which is kind of a proxy for temperature too. And then um, across that, you could kind of make a matrix. Um, there's wet, mesic or music and dry. And so music kind of being intermediate moist. Um, and then within all of that, the forests are further described by their dominant or co-dominant species. So for example, you could have a, a lowland, a wet lowland forest, but then you could also describe maybe the dominant species is ohia, um, or you could have a a music ohia koa uh, montane music forest. Um, there's also diverse music forest, which is there's not even a two co-dominant species. There's not really a dominant uh, set of species, which is really unique. So you might have even ten species that all occur in the same sort of density. Um, and and so yeah, there's a lot of different forest types. They're all unique. And another thing I should mention here. Um, Kauai is home to the most single island endemics of all our Hawaiian islands. And so when you think of that, and then how diverse um, the island is, and I mentioned all the different forest types, with our single island endemic vascular plant species I'm talking about, um, you have species even restricted to those certain forest types, only found on this island, only in that forest type, maybe some of them even on a, a certain ridge in that forest type or within a valley. So it's very unique. And within all of these different forest types, you have these micro um, habitats. So yeah, it's very diverse. Uh, I don't know, Michelle, maybe if you wanna add anything. Well, I'll just add a little tidbit about that Kauai lowland uh, diverse music forest. It actually has the highest number of endangered species per unit area of any place in the country. So there are so many endangered plant species that occur there. Luckily, we have some um, areas protected. And by protected, I mean they've been fenced to exclude uh, feral ungulates. So that would be pigs, goats, and black-tailed deer. I might be jumping ahead of myself here, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, I would love to, I mean, I'm going to, so the reason we have all these unique and different uh, microclimates and forest types and forest ecosystems is because, why? Because we are the oldest island of the main Hawaiian islands. We've had more time for, you know, biodiversity and erosion and all of this to develop. Is that a correct? That's inaccurate? part of it. I think that plays into it. Yeah, I, I didn't mention also um, different substrate types, different soil mm -hmm. types. Um, so yeah, and being the oldest island, that's uh, that goes along with one of the, yeah, one of the reasons we probably have more single island endemics and just being more, like you said, eroded, the, the topography like you see in the um, Nepali region. Right, right. And just for everybody who's watching, just to make sure endemic, uh, when we use that word, we mean if it's an island endemic, meaning that that is a plant perhaps that's found on Kauai and nowhere else, no other islands. It is mm -hmm. endemic to Kauai. So um, yeah, we've had more time, you know, we're an older island, so there's been more time for adaptation to happen and to speciation you know, mm -hmm. to occur to where we have this great biodiversity. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, what makes our forests so unique and special. Would you agree with that? Yeah, All that's definitely part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, last week, the big news across the country uh, was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced um, the extinction of, I think it was 23 different species across the United States. 
eight of those species um, were forest birds that came from Hawaii. Eight of the 23 species that across the United States were determined to be extinct are Hawaii forest birds. Four of those came from Kauai. Um, so that's a little disappointing news um, to hear. And we do, you know, as we've already mentioned, you know, a lot of endangered species here in Hawaii. Um, but let's flip that. Let's talk about endangered forests. Do we have endangered forest ecosystems in Hawaii? Uh, Michelle, do you want to take that? Well, actually, yes, we do. <laughs> um, we were the first in the country to designate critical habitat for entire ecosystems. So we have uh, lowland music, um, lowland wet, montane music, montane wet, and then dry cliff and wet cliff um, ecosystems that have been designated as, as critical habitat. And so the reason for using that approach is um, to address common threats across like ecosystem level threats. So like feral ungulates is an example of an ecosystem level threat. And so by addressing these threats that's, that span across the landscape, um, you can conserve more species at once rather than just going for species specific conservation. But we get also saying that we have so many endangered species here is that we can't just do ecosystem level conservation without seeing a huge chunk of our biota. We have actually 170, maybe even more uh, listed species just on Kauai. So we have, to, we have to do both. We can't just um, you know, focus on the ecosystem level stuff, but taking that approach really does uh, help us in the long run by addressing uh, singular threats that affect many different species. Right, right. Okay, thank you. And I do want to clarify, Nina dropped in the chat, Nina with NTBG, um, there was a ninth species that was declared extinct last week. Uh, that was a plant um, in Hawaii. So nine total species that are Hawaii based out of the 23 that were declared extinct. Um, and that one was a plant, uh, if memory serves, that's found on Lanai. So um, yeah, nine out of 23 is pretty dramatic. Um, yeah, so uh, Lucas and Mehana, this question is directed to both of you. I'd love to hear your thoughts um, from your time that you've spent in Kauai's forests doing the work that you both do. Um, what changes perhaps have you seen over the years? Who wants to go first? Okay, Mehana. Well, I, I, I come at, I'm come from it um, sort of with a practitioner's and a laymaker's eye yeah. um, and others. So I think I mark the changes in forests for me, especially on the Alaka'i Trail, because I love to take my kids. And often we spend my birthday there every year. And actually, we're going to go up on Monday um, with the kids. And so since they were, you know, since I had my first child who's now 13 and he was a baby of six months old and I was carrying him in one of those Bjorns, we walked that trail. And one of the changes I've seen, one of the things we love as laymakers is pa'inu. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to be distracting and changing pictures, um, but pa'inu is the silver, um, that's right here, all the backgrounds, any background I show today is, is from koke, is a lay made in koke. So there's this sort of silver right there. There it is. There's Pa'inu. And it looks like nothing, but to laymakers, it's everything. It's this silvery ribbon. And, you know, they bring in protea leaves from Maui to simulate it. But it's the native Pa'inu. And to me, it's a sign of forest health when I've seen it, especially on, on, in other islands all over the forest floor. Um, because, and, and when you go to the volcano at Kilauea, um, Chance and Mo'olelo, Olelo no Yao say you adorn yourself with a lay of pa'inu, and then you know you were at Kilauea. Mm. Um, and when it grows in abundance on the forest floor, you don't have pigs, because pigs love to eat it. Um, when I hike Alaka'i, we see it on fallen branches, but there's specific spots along the trail that I always see it, and I can mark them. I think of the size of my kids, and this one abundant, abundant, just shock of it. You know, Dr. Seuss eruption 
um, that this last time when we went it was completely dry and it's gotten drier over the years, but this last time it was completely dried up and we know what times of the year it would normally be flowering and um, what I see is drying. Um, I see alaka'i, those initial bogs of alaka'i, each with their own name, each part of Emma's journey across the swamp. Um, really different from when she was sheltering with her whole retinue all night and singing in the cold. Um, still cold, but much less wet for the Lehua Makanoi, which is the bog ohia. Um, I see changes not just in ohia, which we're all worried about, but, but almost every species that we would gather as laymakers, um, you know, even things like kolea, kopiko, um, opelu, um, naenae, um, just, I see a lot of new galls on leaves and things like even an, an ohia that doesn't have rod, but just spots on the leaves you're not used to. The mokihana too, um, sores, kind of these brown puckery wounds. Um, and, and what I feel is that, and, and much more proliferation of invasive species to be sure. Um, the halau I dance for, we're a'ali'i kumakani, a'ali'i is our kinolau, and that's Waimea Canyon, that's drier, that's lower, right? But to find a good patch of a'ali'i that's flourishing and not inundated by invasive grasses at this time, and, you know, we all need to be adopting those patches and weeding those patches, and, you know, our family does a few, but the amount of invasives that are coming in and the speed with that is huge, but I also just feel, um, and not just on Kauai, on Kauai where we don't have much further for things to go and cooler and the movement up. So we're seeing it very strongly in our highest forest, but we even, um, my friend turned 50 and she wanted to go to the top of Ka'ala. So we went with Kapua Cavello folks and did ginger eradication in Ka'ala this summer. And Ka'ala was completely different than I remember it from going, you know, just five years ago, just 10 years ago. Um, in terms of, and partly it's the time of year and partly, but, but I think overall, the saturation of those forests, the amount of water um, feels less and the amount of new diseases and pests um, that the forest thus becomes more vulnerable to is something we see um, in the quality of individual leaves and at that level of looking at individual flowers and just very carefully at those those plants that you see that vahine no homauna fern and you just yay there she is there she is you're waiting for her and you know so much less this last time at Kala because she needs moss and wet. Mm, thank you Mayana. I may see you up there on on Monday because I'm planning to head up there as well so I'll look for you and the family. <laughs> Lucas uh, what about from your experiences um, what are what changes are you seeing in the forest? Oh, thank you Mayana. that was uh insightful and I measure some time by my daughter as well who is now six years old and we've been to see the Iliao on the Iliao loop trail I live in Hanapepe it's not that far from me um, and we measure her essentially by relative to the Iliao themselves so that's always you know one of our favorite times of year in the late spring uh, you know, I, I also agree with the, the sentiment that it's it's drier. There are longer periods without rain. Uh, and then obviously we get storm events where they may or may not be stronger than they have been in the past. And, and we're kind of, again, jumping ahead to threats uh, from climate change. But, you know, that's something that I see as being, you know, really will affect the entire plateau and the wetter, the wet montane forest, that Ohia dominated uh, area that we, you know, consider to be the heart of our watershed. And, you know, in my, in the areas that I've worked, so I'll, I'll go two ways. You know, I've seen the increase in deer, in blacktail deer and their effect on the forest, denuding the understory in new ways than goats and pigs had done it in the past. And think of it as sort of a ladder, goats, or pigs primarily tear up the ground cover and they will hit the pa'inu that is on the ground and goats will kind of browse everything up to a certain level and deer actually come through and go even higher. So when you walk through an open forest that seems native but really just seems somewhat empty, part of that is the, the, the movement of deer 
which were only introduced in the 1960s to the drier forest on the western side of the plateau. And they've really moved into some of those more wet interior spaces, possibly because of the drying out of that forest as well, because they wouldn't live and thrive in wet places the same. So I think that, you know, one of the, the points that Mehana has really sort of honed for us is that as the forest experiences these changes over time in it in the climate, what we're going to see is is less resilient forest or really just the the introduction of more pathogens. I know I'm bleeding into the next one well, some of the next questions, but the things that I've seen is that bleeding. But I've also seen areas that we have fenced and managed, and removed ungulates from, and continue to do weed control in. And the weeds keep coming. You know, the work that we do is sort of, is almost feels never ending. But in the areas that we have fenced and removed animals from, we've seen incredible uh, rebounds in vegetation in the understory and ground cover in these places that we work. And, you know, that gives me some hope that there will be more resilience in those areas that we're actively managing to these sort of threats over time. So, you know, the, the saddest part is that I've, I hear less birds than I did fewer birds when I go into the forest every time. And I know that they're incredibly talented and passionate people working on that. And one of, you know, what I consider my job is sort of advocating for the overall protection of forests, uh, so that we can use that as the, the canvas that we do all of these smaller projects on. I think that, you know, I, I work with all of you on that and I'm very excited about it. So that's my changes in time. Yeah, you know, it's hard to talk about the forest um, and the state of the forest and the fate of the forest and the changes we've seen without talking about threats, right? Um, so of course, uh, but interesting to hear that uh, perspective on the deer because I've only recently started hearing more about deers, uh, deer sightings and, and the impact that deer are having. So um, that might be a little surprising for some of our listeners today. Um, but I do wanna talk about some good, fun, positive things in our forests um, that maybe we haven't hit on yet. And one of them I feel like is kind of the, you know, is under the radar, doesn't get enough attention. And Michelle, I'm, I'm turning to you for, you know, a little bit to hear from you about our invertebrates, our special, unique, endemic, cool spiders and invertebrates that, you know, are found in our forests. I'd love to give you some time to talk about them. Well, <laughs> I wish I, I was more of an expert in invertebrates. I'm definitely just like on the surface of um, knowing them, but I have had the pleasure of working with many entomologists and helping them in the field, um, e even from like, a, and also snail experts, like I got to go out with uh, Noreen Young and um, her husband, Ken, uh, they're from Bishop Museum and you know, we've done snail surveys and unfortunately Kauai has lost many charismatic, spectac spectacular land snails, but there are still uh, quite a few native snails out there. Um, I'll just preface this by insects are really where our, the, like that's a huge chunk of where our biodiversity in the islands comes from. Like there are over 10,000 native insects um, and unfortunately only maybe 4,000 or so have been described. So this is like a full on, like, you know, there's a lot more work that can be done in this area. Um, we have amazing spiders. Just, I was just in the field the other day and uh, a Tetragonantha coiensis happened to land in my finger. And luckily I didn't squish it because they're very small and delicate. And that's always really sad when a native insect lands on you and you freak out and then like you squish it like that's a good feeling but anyway um yeah so that that tetragonantha there are several species on Kauai and some of them exhibit some very interesting behaviors there's this one that is um actually uh they 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 caught these spiders and put them in captivity and they didn't they don't know how to recognize, the males don't know how to recognize females. So the males were trying to mate with each other. And there's a paper on this. Like I could put, put a link in, in the chat box for those of you that are interested, but there has been homosexual behavior noted in this uh, species of spider that's related to the tetragonantha. 
Yeah, and we have the world's only um, eyeless wolf spider, the blind cave spider of Kauai. That's 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 not really part of this talk because it lives in a cave in Kaloa, but it just goes to show like how spectacular like um, these insects are, how how great like how there's they're marvelous examples of adaptive radiation and evolution. Not only they're just they're like the honey creepers, they're like our plants, but they don't get as much attention because they're small. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like that's just a field that's right for some of our young people to go into and study more and you know raise more awareness about um, those species. Because like you say, there's sounds like tens of thousands of them that again are unique and or endemic. To and they're so important to the health of the forest. Like they help with nutrient cycling and uh, pollination. And so, you know, they really are important when it, in the grand scheme of uh, forest health. And there are a few, like uh, the fabulous green sphinx, sphinx moth of Kauai. Like we've been actively searching for it. It's only been seen a handful of times since the 1980s. And it may have been a pollinator of uh, Bergamia and Cygnus, which that was one of Shauna's uh, research subjects. She might be able to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I only was gonna, I, oh, go ahead. I just wanna say, um, I've actually seen that one at Bishop Museum mm. in, the, in the drawers, you know, that the back rooms of Bishop Museum has these wonderful drawers and there was this little label and it fabulous green swing spot and I was like can I look at that um yeah that would, it's a beautiful moth but yes that leads perfectly into Shauna because I also wanted you to address that but as well talk a little bit about um and we are running out of time so if you would make it brief because then after um you speak I do want to see if there's questions from our audience. But I'd love to hear you talk about, you know, some of these co-pollinators, um, you know, with our, with the flora and fauna, right? As well as maybe some of the recent discoveries or rediscoveries that we've had in the plant world here on Kauai. So again, let's celebrate some of this good stuff. Yeah, so I was only gonna add, I didn't know you were gonna jump to me, but that um, with Michelle talking about the, um, the insects and all that. From a early 2000 paper, um, this is based, I think, mostly on floral morphology and whatnot, but like 67% of our native plant species are presumed to be dependent on insect pollination. So that's huge. You know, we think of the birds as the main pollinators, but it really, it's mainly the insects that are the presumed pollinators for the vast majority of our native plant species. Um, and so, yeah, um, <laughs> maybe I'll only mention that about plant that's, pollinator interactions. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's just really good tidbit um, to just let everybody soak that in for a second. But yeah, if you would talk a little bit more about some of our special plant species that we have here on Kauai and, and maybe some of those that you're either working personally with or that have been recently kind of rediscovered through some of the work of the garden. Yeah, there's so much to talk about and I, a lot of it's in the news recently with our uh, GIS and drone specialist Ben Nyberg with using drone technology to uh, survey our cliff habitats which are still relatively intact because you know the invasive animals can't get to and whatnot and so there's been a lot of uh, rediscoveries of previously thought to be extinct species and discoveries of new populations of very rare species. Um, I can mention Hibiscadelphus woodyi. They've seen, they found more of those. Um, different Lysimachia species. I mean, there's so many. <laughs> I can't keep track of all of them. Uh, Unfortunately, no, I won't go into any sad stuff, actually, because this is positive stuff. But um, yeah, species that, another thing I should mention, actually, I, I haven't yet watched the most recent video about the the drone the footage um and work but ben's actually working on a mechanism to be able to collect make collections conservation collection seeds from these species and obviously all the testing is going to be done with like non-native species and very and then very common species to just make sure you know it's not damaging the plan and getting it very precise but besides just being able to survey and then 
inform, if possible, where botanists can go down by ropes to make collections. The next level is going to be actually making collections with these drones and mechanical arm cutting technology. So yeah, I'll stop there because there's not enough time. <laughs> but there's a lot. There's a lot of exciting stuff going on. We could all talk for a couple more hours, but speaking of the drone activity, um, you know, probably many of you, if not all of you know that I work on the Ohia project, um, you know, trying to save our, our special and sacred Ohia trees across the state. And uh, Ryan Peroy with uh, UH Hilo is doing some work with a drone and he's testing this arm. So it's kind of similar to what you're talking about, using a drone with a special arm that kind of has a clippers that will take a limb from a suspect tree that we can then take back to the lab and test for the presence of this fungal pathogen that's killing Ohia. And the reason why that comes in handy is the same reason why it comes in handy for your work. And, you know, Shauna, is that you have these cliffs, especially on Kauai, you know, there's lots of cliffs, lots of steep um, terrain that we can't get to safely to sample uh, trees. So potentially the drone can help us in doing that. So yeah, lots of um, innovative, creative science happening in our forests. Um, let me pause for a second and check in with Julia to see if we have any questions either on Facebook or in the chat from some of our audience. Um, take those if there are any, and then the next thing I'd like to do is talk about, uh, and this will be how we wrap up, talk about you know, our uh, impact on the forest individually, collectively, as a people, and what we can do, you know, when we, you know, should be in the forest, maybe there's times we shouldn't be in the forest and, and what we can do individually and collectively to protect our forests. Um, but Julia, anything that you're seeing? Yes, I have actually two questions um, that came in through the chat. One question is, how big a threat is the little fire ant to the forests, and what are the chances of its eradication? Okay, well, um, I will attempt to take this one on. I do work for Kauai Invasive Species Committee. I don't work directly on this project. Um, its potential impact in our force, it is a, from what I know, it's a tree dwelling ant. So potentially it could get into the forest. Um, but as far as what are the potential chances of eradication on this island, we still have a really, really good chance to make that happen. So if we can contain the newest, most recent outbreak that's in the Moloa'a area, um, we, we have a really good chance to eradicate LFA on this island. But the trick with little fire ants is it's a constant. You know, you just don't eradicate it and you're done. We constantly have to be on our toes about that. We constantly have to be testing um, proactively for the presence of those ants. Because again, from what I understand, they can be present in our environment, in our ecosystem, in our yards um, for years potentially before they really make their presence known. So they can be there in low numbers before they sort of expand into the great numbers where all of a sudden we're like, oh, wow, what's that sticking me? Um, so I think there's a, a really good chance to eradicate that. What was the second question, Julia? Uh, the second question is, how are urban forest ecosystems complementing or denigrating native forests? Will you repeat that again? Uh, how are urban forest ecosystems complementing or denigrating native forests? It's uh, in the chat. I can put it in the chat again. Anybody want to take that one on? Well, I would just say that I don't really feel like we have urban forests here on Kauai because we don't have like a real urban center, but on Oahu, um, they do have what you would consider urban forests and that's actually we are working with a um a private landowner that um has a 200 acre forest in east honolulu and luckily he wants to restore it so um that's been one of my uh new projects that i'm working on and i tell you it's a lot easier to get volunteers over there like they have people on a wait list that want to get out there in the forest on Oahu because you know it's it's like harder to get out into nature there than it is here. So I I'm a full believer of um, you know these of, of 
supporting and promoting urban forest conservation because not only you know gives people an opportunity to connect with nature but um it also uh provides support for all of us because you know that's the urban center that's where most of the people in the state live and so if they can find a way to be supportive of conservation and connect with nature. I think it benefits us all. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, now I'd like to move to, um, this is coming for you, Mehana. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, our presence in the forest, um, kind of, you know, acceptable behavior, Pono behavior, if you will, and, and tie that in perhaps to some of the traditional Hawaiian practices um, of either forest management um, or, or um, you know, just uh, activities in the forest. So I'm thinking like the kapu system, bow, you know, so would you address some of that, Mehana? Sure. I was just thinking about the question of not having urban forests. I think just people's landscaping plants and choices are expecting our forests quite a bit. I know Australian tree fern was a, you know, a landscape introduction. I know there's ties to rod. And so um, I, we have a story we found recently of Queen Lili Okalani coming to Kauai to drive the first railroad tie in Kilauea um, town where I grew up. And the families of Kilauea decorated their homes with ohia um, and sang for her as she came down the street. And we don't think of Kilauea as being surrounded by ohia, but this idea of what's a forest plant, what used to be a forest plant, all the various diverse types of forests and where they are. Um, I think similarly with Hawaiian practices and kapu, we tend to sort of make them all uniform in our head. Kapu means you don't go, kapu means a closure. And whereas kapu were, were very sophisticated and tailored and really about knowing sort of what's appropriate in a given space and time. Um, and so coming back to Lumahai, when we took the students, clearly vau akua. And that didn't mean you didn't go, but it meant you went with a specific purpose. So after our trip, TNC went to do an archaeological survey with this idea of, you know, this was not a place Hawaiians used. Um, and the first thing they found was buried branch coral that had been carried from the ocean all the way to Lumahai, it's inaccessible, the back of the valley almost to walk. There's a huge waterfall, but there was branch coral and that coral in Hawaiian is mana mana, you know, to have lots of mana. So the specific function of going to a forest bearing coral. Oh no. Oh no, we lost Mehana. That was unfortunate timing, but it I have was. I have stood on that same pu'u that that coral was found at the back of Lumahai Valley, and it is a very very powerful spot. It is oh. a an individual distinct ridge and pu'u. Oh yeah, at, right at the back of the valley in that sort of terminus, but in the core in the center of this expansive back lowland dry forest valley. Hello again, Mehana. I was just <laughs> telling them about the the pu'u, where the coral was found. I'm glad there was too much mana. My Zoom shut <laughs> off. Thank you for carrying on. Um, but I guess I guess just related to that, like walking carefully anywhere you go. I think all of the practices about being careful what we bring. When we when we went to Lumahai, I made my high school students freeze everything before they went, all of our clothes, all of it, just just being mindful of our impacts and as careful as possible. Um, I'll, sh I'll I'll tell you, you know, for lay anymore, I don't use ohia. Um, there's a lay I showed you from years ago that has ohia. Everything else today, we don't use it anymore. Um, and you know, it's beautiful in many places. It's flourishing, but it's a time to rest it. But beyond that, um, I, I don't really gather in forest anymore. I gather, you know, when I go with my children, we'll come out with, you know, the fruit grocery bag, maybe half of one of those. Um, the, the times of halal adorning themselves with palapalai from the forest to get on the Merry Monarch stage are gone. And my grandmother knew that. Um, by the time she, you know, was in her older ages, she was growing everything in her yard because she was seeing changes in the forest. So it's, it's a time of, of letting things rest, of being very selective. You know, when I pick now, it's, it's enough for education. I'm, I'm, you know, it's enough to make a a small lay and I can show you the lay I made today 
but it's enough to show children each of these plants and how they're used and what they look like next to each other. It's enough to make a whole kupu that we bring mana to, you know, in a, in a ceremonial function. It's not about uh, mass. And, and we're so careful about cleaning tools, about gathering so little from each place, leaving cleaning in the forest. So you leave as much of the nutrients and everything there as you can. Um, but in general, just, just restraint and, and observation, paying attention. What is the state of it? What does it look like? Is, is it okay to gather? Um, and more and more now, it's just, it's just not, and that's fine. We're gathering with our eyes. We're gathering observations that we're going to pass on to future generations so they'll know how to take care of it, and we're planting. And that was the last thing on that Lumahai trip is amazing Lewan, so young and home from college in Hilo, gathering loulu seeds and climbing the loulu to get there before the rats and gathering maile and coming back to Waipa and making a miniature Lumahai with sprinklers in the Waipa garden and this whole ahu of mokihana and those plants to show the students and to have ceremony and connect those places. And I'm amazed at the Maile people are growing now. And, you know, it's really a time to be planting and growing and saving um, and spreading um, and not, not taking and being as gentle as we can. Um, and giving our voices, <laughs> we can give our voices. And I guess that would be the last thing is when you go, take time, take time. Don't just go from our cell phone worlds and our busyness. Uh, take a moment to offer your oli or just offer your thoughts or be still and you know pay attention and transition um, I think that's an important practice so beautiful Mehana thank you and I, I hope everybody heard her passion in her voice and what I think is great is I, I feel like I've heard passion from every one of our panelists today Lucas Shauna and Michelle as well um, I'd love to give you really just a quick 30 seconds, if you would, Lucas, Shauna, Michelle, let us know what we can do. What are your thoughts on how we can behave in the forest um, in order to help to save our forest, you know, for the young children coming up? Shauna has a young daughter, less than a year old. Lucas has a young daughter. Michelle has some children as well. So Lucas, what can we do to save our forest for the future? And you're on I mute. There you go. I would say, I would say, you know, get out and observe, uh, take, take your friends, take your family, people that don't ordinarily go. Um, I am going to drop, I'm dropping a plug in here for the Kauai Forest User uh, webpage, which is full of great resources on Pono practices and also just, you know, information about the forest itself. And yeah, just enjoy the forest and and then think about ways that you can give back to it. And I think growing more native plants is a great way to do that also. Great. Michelle, your turn. I would say be supportive of our fencing projects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you hear of uh, any environmental impact statements or EAs that are coming up for uh, big fencing projects? Um, we always can use positive comments and support from the community and, and um, moving those forward because there are some people that don't agree with uh, what we are trying to do or don't understand. And so definitely could use public support um, when it comes to time to implement projects. Agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, my son's gonna be 25 tomorrow. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Shauna, your thoughts? Yeah, so besides what everyone else already said, um, for the young people listening, um, even if it's a recording, I'd say volunteer with some of these organizations. It's a great way to learn and get out there and just see if any of these careers are something you might be interested in. And if it is, it's a good experience to have um, just, yeah, to put on your resume <laughs> when you get all technical about it. Um, Agree. I'll add a couple thoughts to that too. And Julia, I'll give you a, a, you know, when I finish, be ready to add in some of yours. I'm going to, I have two thoughts um, at our trailheads right now. You know, I'm the, I, I, I'm Ohia love, right? So you'll notice that there's bootbrush stations at our trailheads. Use them, use them and use them, you know, before and after. I like to say, leave the mud where you found it, which is easier said than done. But that, you know, a lot of seeds, fungal pathogens can move around our island in mud. So you don't want to track mud from one location to another. Um, and secondly, I, you know, when we walk into our houses here, we take our slippers off, right? That's because we're trying to 
keep our house clean and be respectful of our house. I feel like when we go into the forest, we use those boot brush stations. You know, we need to think of the forest as our living room. You know, we need to think of the entire island as our living room and care for it the way we do our own living room. Um, Julia, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, sure, that's, I mean, that's definitely something people should think about. And, and, and when I think about um, what we have been talking about today and also in the previous Forest Fridays, I think the theme that goes through all of them is give the forest a voice. That's the most important thing, right? Because, because we, we have all the power, right? Like if there's indifference and people don't care, then nothing will happen. But there's a lot of people who care. So we all need to be out there and we all need to share the message and we all need to talk about that we want to do something and we want to protect these resources and the, the, this beautiful ecosystem we have here. So go out and give the forest a voice. Yep, love that. And let's, um, I wish we had two more hours to chat because I had lots more questions for everybody. Um, and I would love to hear more stories from everybody. But I also know it's Friday evening and that people probably want to head out and do some things. Uh, before we let you go though, oh, beautiful, Mehana, that's gorgeous. Yep. Slide to share the lay. All backyard things, no forest things today. I love it. I love it. Okay. And just thank you all for, um, yeah, just all the functions you fulfill in taking care of our forests and resources. And Malo Kim for having us and Julia. Absolutely. Yeah. Julia, will you pop up um, the mentee? We have one more mentee question for you. So if again, one more time, if you would uh, open up a new window in your browser and go to menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I dot com. And we should have a new question up there for you. Um, while Julie is doing all the behind the scenes to make that happen, I want to tell you a couple of things. Uh, our next Forest Friday is going to be fun and it's going to be different. Uh, we've decided it's going to happen in three weeks, so it's going to be the last Friday of October, so October 29th at 4 p.m., and the title of it is Ghouls of the Forest, so it's in keeping with, of course, Halloween, so we're going to get silly, we're going to have some fun, um, and you will hear more about it uh, in the next few days. Follow our KISC and or Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project Facebook pages, and you will get details about that. For any of you that missed any portion of this, if you came in late, uh, we have recordings of this. They'll either be on our Facebook pages or they will be in the next day or two up on our YouTube pages. But for now, hopefully you have found menti.com and use the code 21093484. And the question that we have that we want to wrap things up with today is, when do we belong in the forest? You know, when does it make sense for us to go into the forest? So let's see some answers that are popping up. I see you guys have found this. Um, when we can respect it. Yes, to connect when it's Pono with permission, ask permission to go, be aware, look around, you know, is this a good time to be in the forest? When we understand, open our hearts and eyes uh, in the ecosystem, connect, heal, that's a good one, to enjoy it, right, right, this is, a, these are all great answers, thank you, so I, I think everybody gets the idea that we're trying to share is just raising awareness for our forest ecosystems, um, learning more about them, understanding how special they are. So we will take care of them. Um, so thank you all for being here. If, if our panelists would unmute themselves, um, Julia, you too, if there's any last minute thoughts that we wanna share, please do so right now. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Julia. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. Okay, sounds like everybody's feeling very sated. So I want to say again, thank you to everybody for being here. And um, we hope to see you in three weeks for our Ghouls of the Forest. Aloha. Take care. Hello. Aloha. Aloha. Hello. Good to see you, Shana, Michelle. Good to see you, Luke. <laughs> you too. Thank you, Kim and Julia. For sure.